Welcome to Boardroom Bites at nine this morning. Our topic is Brand Shaper, shape your professional brand and polish your personal presence. Our speaker this morning is Laurie Milner. Laurie, if you can put your camera on so everyone can see you. Laurie is a self-leadership expert. She provides practical tools and techniques to achieve tangible, lasting change and quick results. She's got tailored programs that work to translate business strategy into people strategy. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Laurie this morning. I think she's got some great stuff that she's going to share with us. So Laurie, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you and I will see everyone again during the Q&A session. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A, you can also raise your hand and I'll enable the talk functionality. But Laurie, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. It is an absolute honor to be here with you this morning. So to kick off, I want you to think about the brands or the branded products that you've used since you woke up this morning. So think about it. Was it something you're wearing? Was it a toothpaste, something you had for breakfast? Quickly put it in the chat. Think of a brand that you've come into contact with this morning. Bruce, if you can call those out. Is everyone being shy, Bruce? Okay. Everyone is being shy, but hold on. No, so then, yeah, right. you... if we're being shy, don't worry, we've um, just met. Think... So, okay, I'm going to just go through the brands okay. right now. We have Colgate, we have uh, Woolworths, we have Nivea, Sensodyne, Colgate again, Oral B. Brilliant. Um, Woolworths again, Oral B. And awesome. Oh, and that's all. Thank you, everyone. So now, if I said to you, right, I don't know if you can see it through the screen, if you can, if you take an uh, iPhone, I think it's hard with my background. So if you think about an Apple iPhone, what words, images, or experiences come into your mind when you think of Apple? Can you put those in the chat? So when I say Apple, what automatically do you associate with it? Quickly, quickly, because we've got time constraints. Anything coming up for us? So we have uh, Huawei, Colgate Bakers, quality, oh, sorry, quality, innovation, clean and fast technology, uh, reliability, superior products. Brilliant. Uh, excellent. Fantastic. Communication. Jeez, so, too fast, too fast. No, 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 <laughs> fantastic. So thanks, Vis, that's perfect. So then what is a brand? Because a brand it's a promise of the value you know you're going to get from Apple, from that device. If no one said expensive, I know you were thinking it. What else does a brand do? It creates an emotional bond. So if I said to you, think about Manchester, Liverpool, Chelsea, Bulls, Sharks, Sharks, Pirates, Chiefs, there's a sense that um, I'm connecting something. Because remember, when they fall, we fall. When they have a great day, we're on top of the world. And that's what a brand does. It creates an emotional bond. But really what a brand does is it's a sorting device. So if I said to you, I'm going to offer you two bottles of cola. One is Coca-Cola. The other one is just plain, no name, plain red label. Which one are we going for? Obviously the Coca-Cola. Why? Because it's the promise of thirst quenching, of joy, of happiness. So now equally, if we think about people that have become brands, and in the interest of times, I'm going to put my ones up, do we agree that these are definitely brands? And again, if I said to you, let's take Oprah Winfrey, and I said, what words or images do you think of when you say Oprah? You could say humanitarian, great listener, you know, you've got one and you've got one and everybody look under your chair. Those are the kind of words we associate. And Jeff Bezos said it best. And he said, a brand for a product is like a reputation for a person. Think about that. Because in the same way, these brands created these images in our minds, so do you. And what we want to look at this morning is how do we create the desired words that come into people's minds when they think about you? So in other words, what do you have to do to become a brand? Because your brand is the promise you make implicitly or explicitly? What do people expect of you when they engage with you? Because brands that keep their promises are consistent and trustworthy. And from the minute you are engaging with colleagues, with clients, 
even the ladies in pick and pay and Woolies checkout counters, you have a brand because you're either branded as the impatient customer who's not listening or the smooth professional who gets the job done. And your brand is a story and it's a story that helps other people tell themselves a story about you. So everything you do, the way you show up in meetings, the way you dress, handshakes back in the day, are all parts of the story that people tell themselves about you. And most of the time, these stories aren't true because no one knows you as well as you do. So it's up to us to consistently and persistently show up in a way that amplifies our brand. Because your brand is not what you're saying about yourself. It's what other people are saying about you. And you've got to position it or it will be positioned by others. So if I said to you, think about the colleagues that you're working with now, what words come to mind? You're going to start to associate. And it's exactly the same as that people are ascribing a vocabulary about you, whether you're consciously involved in the process or not. So where do we start? What you want to do first is to go, okay, what do I want to be known for? So if you sat and, and do this exercise after our webinars to really think about when, when someone says my name, what are the words I want to be associated with? What do I want to be known for? So that's point one. But then what you need to ask yourself is to say, okay, is it creative? Is it trustworthy? Is it ambitious? Is it dynamic? Is it loyal? What am I doing every single day to demonstrate that? Because we can't walk around with a t-shirt that says ambitious, trustworthy. Our brand is experiential and we're experienced moment by moment, second by second and interaction by interaction by the people we influence and who influence us. And so we've really got to start becoming aware of behavior because it's the things that we do and say that communicate our brand. And that's when a disconnect happens is we say, well, I really want to show up like this, but if the behavior is not congruent, we are not going to create that desired brand. So again, what is the map of how we get there? Our brand is made up of honor, integrity, the skills and knowledge we bring. And I'm going to say consistency a lot this morning, but central to our brand is self-awareness. Where are our blind spots? Where are our strengths? It's that accountability that we are taking responsibility for the actions we take. But really central is attitude. Because think about people in your team, people that you work with, those go-giver, those can-do people, they will go above and beyond. That's who we want to rally around. So let me ask you, did you see the movie Harry Potter? And if you did or if you didn't, in the movie Harry Potter, there are these creatures called Dementors. And when they walk away from you, it's like the soul's been sucked out of you. Do you know someone like that? You have a conversation and they walk away and you think to yourself, oh, but I feel drained and they're negative. And the attitude that they've got is how we associate with how we associate them. That becomes part of their brand. They're difficult, they're draining, they're negative. And sometimes it's in our families. But that's why thinking about all of these kind of things is how we start to create a great brand. And if you can see the four, the, the other four elements in the circles, and there's a bonus fifth one, this is what we're going to unpack this morning. So starting with our physical presence, the message that you send out every day is shaped by the way you choose to dress, the way you hold yourself, and the way you connect with others. So you may as well send out a message that projects the best version of yourself and often when we think about personal branding, of course, we're going to think about dress. But what you need to remember is dress is the effect that you want to have on other people. And I know we're in COVID and we're remote and we're at home. And it's not to say that we need to put on our best suits every day. But if we are engaging even remotely, it doesn't matter with our teams, with our clients, what is the effect that you want to have on them? Because think about when you're going to take a flight, how does the pilot arrive? He's dressed in that uniform and there's that aura of authority and you think, I trust that person. And so the thing to remember about dress, it's not about budgets, it's not about wardrobe, it's am I inspiring trust? But from a physical presence as well, it's that authenticity. And the question to ask yourself is, am I bringing my full self to work every single day? You know, there's no geographic discrepancy now where we had our work life and we had our home life, everything's in one and we can't separate ourselves. 
and we can't think, well, I'm going to present my work version today and I'll, you know, I'll be the other part of me later. We've got to arrive. And I love this quote by Seth Godin. And it's really just acting the same way, whether someone else is looking and always showing up as a pro, especially when you don't feel like it. Now, when it comes to communicating and receiving a message, there were stats, and I'm, you may be familiar with these, that when it comes to receiving a message, only 7% is about the actual words that come out of our mouth. 38% is tone of voice and 55% is body language. So really what we're saying is that it's not so much about what we say, but how we say it. And a lot of what I'm going to share with you now, I call a series of BLOs, blinding lights of the obvious. And you're going to think, well, I know that. Well, I know that. But the point is common sense is not always common practice and it's the things we know but we don't always implement and that's the difference between how we create a powerful brand so if you think about the verbal something to consider is when you're sitting in a meeting mind what you're shutting down don't be that person who keeps saying can't be done it's impossible be the problem solver but equally is for me the more interesting thing is the nonverbal. Because when you walk into a room, whether online or in person, the second you walk in, people are sizing up your physical presence. So how confidently did you walk into that room? Because they are making decisions on everything they see. And some of the aspects of the nonverbal we don't always think about, number one is around preparation. If you are having a meeting with a client, a new prospect, a supplier, have you gone onto LinkedIn? Have you gone on to learn more about this person? What are their interests? Have they published posts? Of course, we're going to research the company and the industry. But now when you're having a perhaps a first time meeting, A, you know what they look like. But you could say, wow, I saw that you're really interested in leadership and global warming. I think that this article, this book would be really interesting to you. And they're going, wow, this person has done their homework. Equally, it's around participation. Think about people that you work with, perhaps people in your teams. And if there's a meeting, and if you're sitting in a meeting, they've got so much potential, but they don't say a word. And what tends to happen is they become a no-name brand. You know, pick and pay, dishwasher, no-name brand, fabulous for dishwashers, not for them or for you. The point is, those kind of opportunities is when we can show our value, when we can show our word. This is what I think and why, even if we've got that voice going on in our head that's going, oh, what if I sound stupid? That's the way we show our brand because what happens is if you think about that person who's not saying anything that you know, they become known as, you know, they're really sweet, but they just never say a word. They take good notes. And the last thing is around being punctual because if you arrive late for someone, you're signaling to that person, I don't respect your time. I'm sure you've got someone in your life, personal or professional, that are always 20 minutes late. And sometimes you have to lie to them to, so that they do eventually arrive on time. But what we associate with them is that they're not reliable. We don't know if we can trust them with our clients. I don't know if they're a good planner because they constantly show up late. And really our work is the currency of ourselves. That's how we show our physical presence. And it's imagining that every single thing that we're doing, whether it's a presentation, a proposal, a meeting, has got a giant brand you stamp and are your attributes on that when we're putting it out things like transparency if something's gone wrong. But really, I think it's bringing back that human touch. Even when we were sitting in our offices, if someone was sitting across from you, most likely you'd send an email, not get up, walk across or go a flight of stairs. And I think especially now, the more we can bring back that human touch, not get lost in, in our online meetings, the more powerful a brand we can become. Now I want to ask you, how do you show up with stress and conflict? And this is a really important question because you could be the most articulate, well-groomed, tick all the boxes on the physical, but if, you're, if you don't know how to manage stress and conflict, you become known as perhaps difficult to work with. They're a problem exacerbator and that becomes part of your brand. And so when it comes to that, the, a difficult conversation, a courageous conversation, you want to react to the outcome, not to the event. So now you know what you want to be known for. React to that. What is my intention of this conversation? Do I just want to be right? Or do I want to find the best way forward? 
And last year, I had a meeting with a, a charity organization. And I arrived for the meeting on time. It was in the middle of town. It was a rainy day. And as I was walking through the doors, the client, Jill, was literally walking past me. And I said to her, Jill, don't we have a meeting? And she said, you know what? I've got such a headache. I just want to go to the clicks and go home. And I literally took a breath and I said to myself, what do you want to be known for? And I had to insert a mental pause button. And I said, I'm really sorry you're not feeling well. And I walked her to her car and I said, next time, you know, you'll come to our offices. I really hope you feel better. And that was reacting to the outcome. But don't get me wrong. When she walked through that door, she canceled that meeting. She didn't bother to phone. She could have said, don't come today. I was frustrated and I was annoyed because like you guys, I planned my diary. But I had to insert that pause because if I reacted to the event and I said, but why didn't you phone me? You know, like what a waste of my time. Why? I would be labeled as a very rude person. Even if the onus was on her to cancel me, it was my accountability, how I chose to react to it. And think about equally when you get a rude email, rude SMS, a rude WhatsApp. What do you want to do straight away? <clears throat> you know, irritated and I'm going to mail back to them. How many times have you got yourselves into trouble because or you know someone who has because you reacted on anger and emotion? And that can sabotage because now it's in cyberspace. So insert that pause, write the mail, put it into drafts. You know, perhaps to say to that person, look, you know, I'm not feeling comfortable. I really want to think about this response. Let's touch base tomorrow. Let's touch base this afternoon. Never react to emotion. And then your body has got the most innate wisdom. Think about when you start to get upset, angry, someone triggers something in you. Where do you feel it? We all feel it differently. For me, I feel like my throat is starting to close. Some of us, it's our fists clenched. You feel it in your stomach. You, you know, you frown in your face. Use your body wisdom to, to remind you and to alert you, ah, maybe it's time to take a step backwards. And then self-reflect. This is what branding is all about. Is it always somebody's fault? Are you always in a conflict situation? Is it always someone else? Is there always a blame game? And it's really about saying, is this a common pattern in my life? Maybe it's something I need to look at. And again, it's saying, is this design message congruent with the reputation I'm, I want to create? Do I need to say this? Is it necessary to say this? Now, another thing in interpersonal is think about feedback, because the way for us to create powerful brands is about asking for feedback. There's a, a quote by Ken Robinson that says, feedback's the breakfast of champions. And perhaps it's about reaching out to your colleagues and saying, so Jack Canfield has a great way to do this. And he says, how would you rate me as a manager this week, as a leader this week, as a partner this week? And if they answer anything below 10, you would say, okay, what would it take to make it a 10? So if they give you a seven, what would it take for me to be a 10 out of 10 in my leadership role this week? But then equally, it's also about the way that we give feedback because we're in a position now where feedback does have to be given. But the way that we do it can really make or break that person, shatter their confidence, rise them up. And when it comes to giving feedback, you want to start with the positive. I'm really happy with this. You performed so well here. So happy with this. This client was happy. But when it comes to this, I wanted to touch base on this specific element. And I think we can improve over here. I think that this is something you should consider. Because when you start with a positive, I'm now open. I'm, I'm able to receive what you're going to say to me. But if you start a conversation with, my God, you messed up that meeting, I'm shut down. And I'm not going to hear anything that could potentially raise me up. And then it's just about self-awareness, being self-aware. What am I like under stress? How do I react when other people are under stress? And when you know how you are under stress, Go sit in another room, go to a boardroom, go find a quiet space, take a breather, because you are responsible for the energy that you are bringing into the room. So if you think about, you know, we get those beautiful candle diffusers and we put in some lavender and some incense and it makes it beautiful. We are the diffusers, whether it's in our office, our home, our teams, our family, what are we infusing? Is it that stress, that anxiety, that overwhelm? What are we filtering out? Or is it that calm confidence? Now, this was the bonus gift I spoke about. 
we also, it's not so much about how we show up interpersonally, but it's also how we show up intrapersonally. How are we showing up to ourselves? And confidence starts in the mind and it starts with the thoughts we tell ourselves. And research says that we have somewhere between 12 and 60,000 thoughts a day. So guys, I always say you play on the 12,000 side and ladies, we're somewhere north of 60,000. But what the research says is that these thoughts are considered, 80% are considered negative, battling guilt, the inner critic. And also what's more disturbing is that these thoughts are repetitive. So we're having the same thoughts every day. And when that happens, stop, challenge, choose. Stop yourself, challenge the thoughts. I'm not good enough. I'm never gonna get there. Is it based in reality? Is it my irrational thinking? And then choose a better thought. And I'm not saying have false psychology. We're going, I'm amazing, I'm amazing. And you don't believe it, but recognize that that thought is sabotaging. And what am I going to do to change it? Because our thoughts become the operating system of our bodies. Think about your phones. You know, we're not still sitting on version five. You know, you're sitting on version nine or 10 or whatever the latest upgrade is. Your phone upgrades automatically, but sometimes we don't. And we need to really sit and think about if I want to work towards this, this kind of a brand, what do I need to let go of? What are the thoughts I need to let go of? The habits, the patterns, the triggers, because those thoughts become our story. And what is the story you tell yourself? Is it I'm too old? I'm too young. Should have done it in my 20s. I'm an introvert. I'm bad with numbers. I'm terrible at public speaking. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. And it's really about understanding what that story is, because that story is going to prevent you from showing up to what you really want to do. If there's a specific role you want to take on, you're working towards, and you've told yourself you're shocking at networking, you're bad at public speaking, you're never going to put your hand up for it. So think about the story. And as if Brené Brown says, if we, narrate, if we own the story, we get to narrate the ending. And really, it's so powerful because that self-talk that inner dialogue is what's going to make us a, phen a phenomenal brand. Because if you're stepping into a situation and the, and the self-talk is full of self-doubt, I don't deserve to be here, I'm not this, I'm not that, it's going to filter through in everything, in your body language, in your demeanor, in the way that you present yourself. And set the intention, decide, take your three words, four words, and take a, set an alarm to go off before a meeting, before or even just random times during the day. Bold, confident, inspiring, trustworthy. Have that alarm going off to remind you, this is who I want to become. And then what you need to do is make sure that our actions, our behavior is aligned to who we want to be. Now, all of this that I've spoken about is our in-person and in-person even if we're doing online meetings, but virtual could be every email, social media, WhatsApp, everything in a virtual channel. Now think about when you get an email, you've got three choices. You're going to save it. You're going to read it immediately, or you're going to put it into the draft. So drafts, read now or delete. But how do we decide? The name of the sender is as much a brand as a newsletter or a website. And when Palmy sends me an email, I know that I'm responding to it immediately because I know there's value. And what you want to think is when my email hits somebody's inbox, I want them to think the same thing of me. And some of the things to consider for virtual is around, okay, so be on time, prepare. Don't log on at one minute to 10. Log on 10 minutes before. Your computer could do an update. You need to find the link. You know, the webs, the, the power is just gone. So do everything you can to show up on time. Because if we start to have this, I'm just going to show up five minutes late. What's the point? Everybody's always five minutes late. It becomes culture. Make email effective. So think about, you know, there's nothing worse when you receive an email that goes, FYI, thoughts, question mark. I need this ASAP. And ASAP is toxic. To think about it, don't make someone trawl through eight, you know, previous emails and hope you get all the details. So we've got to really think about what are the mails we're sending. And I also dress for the day. You know, it's not only the effect on other people, it's what is the effect I want to have on myself. You're not going to be in a peak state sitting in your PJs or your Sunday bests. And a really powerful, powerful suggestion for your teams is to show up with a camera on. Because remember we said 55% of nonverbal, 
well, 55% of a message being transmuted is the nonverbal. If your camera's off or if their camera's off, you're missing the facial expressions, you're missing a smile, you're missing a frown, you're missing the fact they haven't shaved in six weeks and they're in a bad state. So really for to create that connection, show up with the camera on. And then lastly comes to, because I just want to get to the next section. So when you're driving, you get to just flick through the slides. Also in terms of the your virtual presence, have a LinkedIn profile, have a strong profile, have the photo there, have a basic summary and publish, publish articles. It's a great thought leadership way, um, thought leadership channel. And lastly, just something to consider, and it's probably not for you guys, but for your teams, because we've got 100 WhatsApp groups now, consider the WhatsApp profile photo. Is it, is it representing the best version of you? Think about your teams. We're on client chats, we're on supplier chats, we're on team chats. Consider the photo. And the last area I want to move into is our social presence. And it's not enough to just be known as dynamic or ambitious. It's what are we doing to create really meaningful relationships? And if you think about the old ways, you know, when you think about networking, we, we picture those old school back in the day, you know, those like social mingles with the horrible fried foods and you walk around and you get business cards and they go into a drawer and you never use them. That is not networking. Networking is about connection, conversation and collaboration. And conversations are the currency of change because that is where we start to add value. That's where we understand what people need. When you've had a meaningful conversation, you could then send that person an, an article. I had a client who was having her first child and I came across a Harvard Business Review post talking about the benefits of um, the benefits for children with working mothers. And I sent her the link and I said, yeah, I thought you'd appreciate this. Have a great day. But are we having enough conversations? And often what stops us from doing it is we think, well, I don't have enough time. I'm too busy. I'm, I'm under the gun. COVID's made work even more hectic. But we got to network most when we need it least. And the thing that often stops us is fear. And it's false evidence appearing real. Why don't we reach out? Because it's the fear of the unknown, the unknown outcome, the discomfort of having to go through that conversation but success is measured by the amount of uncomfortable conversation we're willing to have and the amount of uncomfortable questions we're willing to ask. And often the thing we most need to do is the thing we fear the most. So what is that? Is that conversation, that email, what is stopping you? And then what's the worst case? Maybe they say no, but at least you've done it. And the reason you want to move through the fear is because if you think about everything you've got now in a circle, right? And then you draw another circle, and that's everything you want that you're aspiring towards. The, the way we are now is the comfort zone, and the way we want to be is the courage zone. And often the, we, we know that the best opportunities is just outside the fear. So you've got to get comfortable being uncomfortable and moving into that courage zone. Now, one of the words you should really consider writing down is about trust because that's what we want to aim as leaders now. We want to instill trust in our people, trust in our clients, trust in our suppliers. And the way that we do that is through listening. Because the more we listen, the more people tend to share because we've got a need to be heard. And when we don't feel heard, we feel invisible. And listening is simply, it's not about waiting for your turn to speak. It's not about one upping. You know that person that you go, I'm really stressed. And they go, you stressed. You have no idea what I'm going through. You sick. Oh, my goodness. It's not that. And it's also not about fixing it. Because often someone says something to us and you're busy thinking, that's what they can do to fix it. But often we don't want a solution or advice. We just want to be able to share. Now, Google did an interesting research project called uh, interesting research about what makes the best teams. And they did all kinds of combinations and what they found made the best team was psychological safety. The, the fact that there was a sense of connection and belonging in the teams. So that if you critted my idea, I know that you're not criticizing Lori, you're criticizing my idea. And that's how they made the best teams. And especially now, the question to ask yourself is what am I doing to create a safe space? What am I doing to create a sense of belonging? What am I doing to create safety? And it could be as simple as 
making it safe for people to make mistakes. Because there's so much uncertainty now and so much unknown, people don't want to move forward. Are we making it safe for people to make mistakes? And I love this ad because this came from KFC last year that in the UK, they ran out of chicken. They changed suppliers. They ran out of chicken, but they didn't blame. They went, they owned it. They went, you know what? I'm really sorry. This is what's happening. This is what we're doing to fix it. And as leaders to be vulnerable and to, and vulnerability is not about sharing a deep, you know, personal childhood story. It's showing your human side. Um, I have a client who they, they publicly, they had a town hall to say, you know what? We tried a new payroll system and it bombed. And this is what we learned from it. And we shared our mistakes and it's making safe for people to share. So what can you do now during this time to create really powerful connections? Shine a spotlight on mental health. Not if, because people got this idea that if I tell you that I'm anxious, if I tell you that I'm overwhelmed, what if you judge me? What if you think I'm weak? What if I don't get that position? Or what if you, what if I'm, you know, they see it as career limiting, but make a safe space, get someone to chair a, um, a mental health committee. People can share their stories. You don't have to go put that forward if, if that's not who you are, but create a safe channel for conversation. Um, guys, you're going to get the slides um, and I'm getting out of time. But the one thing that I really wanted to mention in terms of creating connections is share the vision. Share your vision because with everybody sitting remote, teams are at home. Some of us are with family. Some of us are on our own. Instill the vision of the company. Instill the vision of what you doing matters. What you doing on a Wednesday morning, sending that email. This is the bigger picture. What you do matters. And so there is that motivation. That is that inspiration. That People do feel that what I'm doing is contributing to the greater whole. And if we can bring people together and share that, that's how we start to rally. And then think what you can do from a thought leadership piece in your own personal brand capacity. So publishing posts, doing interviews, sharing articles, what are you doing to share yourself as a thought leader? And so really, if you think about what branding is. This quote summarizes everything I've spoken about today. And it's from Austin Cleon, and he said, build a good name, keep your name clean, don't make compromises, don't worry about making a bunch of money or being successful, be concerned with doing good work. And if you can build a good name, eventually that name will be its own currency. And so Woody Allen said 80% of life is just showing up. And Tom Peters, the branding guru, said showing up also means starting. So if I said to you, did you show up at the gym today or, you know, back in the day, you did the hard part. Think about it because all that's left is to do the workout. Getting there is the challenge. And it's the same with opportunity. It's the same with anything we want. It's the same with the brands we want to create. You're 80% there if you're just showing up to those opportunities every day. And this is about creating the best version of yourself but then showing up as the best version of yourself every day. And so what we've looked at is our brand is the culmination of everything we do and everything we say. So think about what you wanna be known for and act congruently. Think about who do I need to reach out to? What do I need to do to get into that courage zone and take action? And I assure you that if you do, you will all continue to be phenomenal brands and truly own your space. So from me, thank you. So Vix, do you want to open up to, to Q&A? Sure, Laurie, let's do that. Um, again, if anyone does want to ask any of their questions um, verbally, they can raise their hand and I'll enable the talk functionality. Um, Laurie, um, there was some questions around how do you assess body language on an, on an online meeting when cameras are off, but I think you have covered that um during the session so but i can i can chat to them so you're saying how do you cover body language when the camera's off yeah you cannot yeah. and that is why all you've got if the camera's off is a tone of voice all you've got if if someone is really you know feeling really down or if they energized in their voice and that is why keeping the camera on is so powerful and, even, and, and the thing is, you know, we, we isolated, teams are isolated. And the more that we can create that connection, the more that we can have that eye contact. And another reason why keeping the camera on is that people tend to fall into the bad practice 
practice of multitasking on meetings. So you think, well, I've got so much to do. I'm going to just, I've got one screen here. I'm going to keep the camera off and I'm going to check my mails while I'm doing this. And a lot, and I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of guilty nods. So for many reasons, the one is to show that you're present, two, that you are present and you, you, where possible, encourage the camera to be on because you're missing so much information by not being on. And, you know, say to your team, say, guys, I don't care if you're sitting in pajamas and your hair's in a bun, put the camera on so we can see each other. How do you encourage I people? That answers it. Yeah, how do you encourage people to, to put their cameras on, though? Because you, you are seeing, and I think because the more we're now sitting in these Zoom virtual meetings, people tend to now put their cameras up. How do you actually encourage someone to, to put their camera on? And so I'm coaching, on? I'm coaching a leader at the moment, and she was saying that there's a lot of, you know, that there's not a lot of motivation in the team and people are dropping the ball on a lot of things. And I said, okay, well, how are you conducting your meetings? How often? Um, so they've moved it now to weekly. And she said, but everyone's got the camera off. So I said, but then you must tell them to put the camera on. So you just need to say, guys, please, as a requirement, I need the camera. Let's put cameras on. And people aren't going to feel comfortable at first. But once, and I, and I don't know why, because I use the phrase that imagine, imagine tomorrow we were back in the offices. You wouldn't hide under the boardroom table and go, I don't want people to see me. So why are we doing it? when we if we're working at home we still need that engagement and i think it's simply saying in order to make these meetings more effective in order for us to take more out of it we need the cameras on so i should put my camera on as well <laughs> uh -huh. um so another question we've got from karabo do you have any personal tips on overcoming procrastination oh i have many I, have, I can do a whole workshop on, in fact, I do run a whole workshop on that. Um, Karaba, some things around procrastination, which is quite interesting, is that often we associate it to be a time management tool, but it's actually a stress management tool. And we have got a lot of uncertainty and a lot more anxiety during this period than we would normally. And so you are busy thinking about you know, the uncertainty and job and the economy and my mom who's sick and you know all these things. And then you sit down to work and your prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for the big decision making goes, oh, but I've been thinking about mom all day, let's watch cat videos. And so it's an escape. It's a way to, to move away from that. So what you need to start to do is to create a starting ritual. And also why we put off a task is, is we often, we don't know where to start. There's overwhelm and there's a fear of failure, fear of not being perfect. So you can't control the stress, but you can create a starting ritual. And if you just said to yourself, I'm going to sit down and work for five minutes and you just do work for that five minutes, research says 80% of us, we're going to continue, but it's getting into the habit of starting. And something else that we, that helps a lot with procrastination is chunking it down. So if you need to build a big presentation, often the thought of the presentation is what's daunting. It's what if I, you know, because if I don't do well, I'm not going to, you know, it's going to impact my career and my impression. And so we start thinking about what the presentation means. And in order to avoid the feeling of the anxiety, we want to avoid the task. So chunk it down. Don't think the presentation. Go, what is the simplest first step I can do right now? All I'm going to do now is I'm going to create my table of contents. I'm going to write slide one. I'm just going to write the heading for slide one. Done. And that's what I call a micro win, is when you take the big goal of the presentation and you chunk it down into like little Lego bricks. So now next time you come back to it, you've started. Okay, there's the heading. What's the next thing? What are three bullet points that can relate to that heading? That's all I'm going to work on now. And it's the progress. As soon as you've started progress, that's what's going to energize you. It's when we've avoided something and we know we've avoided something and we've broken that agreement with ourselves. That's when the anxiety builds because it's, I've got to do the presentation. I've got to do the presentation. Whereas if we can just start, make tiny bits of progress, and then eventually you're going to hit your stride and you're going to go, geez, I didn't know why I waited so long to start this. So those are some things that you can do around procrastination. Thank you, Laurie. Um, so a question, how has Coca-Cola built one of the best brands in the world? I don't know if you can answer that. That's interesting. So, so really, I think the, the secret to Coke's success has just been consistency. It's been consistency over time. So it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, if you were driving through a strip in the Karoo and there was one little spaza shop, there's a Coca-Cola advert there. 
And what they're really good at is just keeping it top of mind all the time. And what Coke does really well is that they, they're not selling the product in their advertising. They're selling an experience. They're selling an emotion. They think about it. It's that joy and that connection with friends. And what does Coke do? It brings it all together. And that's what we get attracted to. So, it, and then, you know, either if you're feeling down or you're reaching for something, A, because you've seen it all the time, it's top of mind, but it's that emotional connection it has with us. And that's what they're doing so powerfully. Even though it's one of the most unhealthy beverages in the world, bless them, they've managed to convince us why it should be our number one choice. That is very true. Shadrick um, has a few questions. So he said, it appears some key personalities with negative branding are able to turn it around by hiring brand experts to help them to change it to a positive um, or for the positive. This happens most of the time in the political realm. Can, a, can the positive image achieved this way be enduring? First question. Um, and can there be any ethical concern for the character involved in the brand expert or company or, or individual involved helping to turn around, um, I guess, that personal brand? Thank you for your question. Um, that's a very thoughtful one. And I think you know, for me, it's, it's whether you are a, a political candidate, whether you are in your own personal capacity, because a lot of the time people will say to me, but I think I may have damaged my brand. What should I do? And you can behave, you, you may have behaved yourself out of trust, but you can always behave your way back into trust. But, you know, you can't, there's a difference between saying, right, I'm going to hire someone who's going to make me dress in a certain way and they're going to write my speeches and the messages all sound fine. Yes, on the surface, that's the, it's kind of the artificial image you're trying to paint, but it's never going to be long lasting because you will see the authenticity of that person come through in many other ways. So maybe in one channel, they're going, this is who I am. And even if you go back to um, our virtual presence, Consistency is so powerful because you can't arrive in person one way, be on Facebook in one way, be on social media in another way. You've got to be the same person consistently across. And so the answer to your question is, yes, you could do some, you know, call it a facelift or you could do some cosmetic work, um, if, if you know what I mean, in terms of trying to up the image. But it comes down to behavior. Trust is about consistency and your actions. And if you can behave your way, and, and how can you do that? If someone perhaps, you know, really dropped the ball over this period and they've realized where they're at and now they're in a better space um, mentally, if they start showing up on time, if they start going above and beyond, if they start delivering on time, if they start saying, what else can I do? You know, I'm not at full capacity. Where else can I be a value? You're going to start to go, wow, you know, this person's really turned themselves around. So, but it's got to be genuine. You can't because what's going to happen is that perhaps for a period of time, they can keep up the appearance. But if you haven't changed on the inside, because behavior change and, and branding is about identity change. That's how you want to, because it's a slide that I never got in and it will cover this question now. So yes, you want to, you can behave your way into it. Um, ethically, I, you know, I, I don't really want to get involved in anything. I don't think it's ethical and I don't think it's, and I, I think it's not going to last. If you, if you, at some point, the authentic you is going to come out because you're going to forget and you're going to think, oh, I didn't do that thing I'm supposed to do. So it's got to come from the inside out. It's got to come from identity. It's not, you know, if, if you want to create a new habit, it's not about I'm reading a book. It's I'm a reader. You, you transforming from the inside out and something that you could think about is your future self because we were not the same person five years ago, right? And so if you think about the you in three years time, equally, you're not going to be the same person and sit down and think about what do I want that person to be like? Who is future me? And then see yourself and that person as two separate people because if that person is sitting in the courage zone that you are dreaming about, you need to say, okay, in order for me to grow into that, in order for me to grow my brand into that person, what am I doing today? So maybe the me of today is petrified of public speaking, but I need to be authentic to future me. So I'm going to tell myself every time I'm in a meeting, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to put my, you know, my hand up for that project. And so you need to think about who am I growing into to make sure the actions today are going to get you there. Thank you, Laurie. Um, 
quite a few questions coming through here. Um, so let's look at, there's a question on, so in your experience, it was from DPLA, what impact has COVID had on personal branding? Uh, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the impact it's had. COVID has, I've called it, it's, it's the amplifier. It has become the great amplifier. If generally there was a personality who was always going above and beyond, always pulling their weight, always doing that extra, they are continuing to do that and more so. If you were someone or you know, you know, if there was someone who didn't always try to do their best, they kind of, they could, they could hide, you know, they could fall between the cracks and they could get away with doing the bare minimum. This COVID has shone a spotlight. You cannot hide. If you are dropping the ball, if you are not pulling your weight, if you are not meeting your deliverables, you cannot hide away from that. And I think that's what COVID has done. And I, th I think it's brought a huge amount though, having said that, I think it's, it's also been a platform where you see personalities coming out because you, you, we've always got the choice. And again, that comes down to attitude. It's been a very frenetic year and it's been uncertain and it's destroyed economies and it's destroyed businesses. And, you know, we can all tell a story about how we know someone that was deeply, deeply affected, if not ourselves, but we've all been affected mentally, you know, emotionally on every single level, it's rocked our worlds. But the difference and where the brand, you as a brand will show up is your attitude. Did you choose to go to ask the question, why is this happening to me? What am I gonna do? Why am I self-sabotaging? This has been the worst year ever. Or are you gonna ask the question and go, what can I learn from this? What am I gonna do to grow? What am I gonna do so that I can move into the next level? Maybe it's revealed if your job perhaps was completely taken away or hampered in any way. And you went, okay, what can I do to pivot? What skill do I need to then move into that direction. So I think it's shown you a lot of at the core is what is your attitude? How do you see the world? Are you choosing you know, to say, oh, poor me? Are you choosing to let the anxiety overwhelm? Or are you choosing to say, actually, this is an opportunity for me to be a leader. This is an opportunity for me to demonstrate who I am in crisis. And you don't need a fancy title to be a leader. Anybody can be that person. And I think COVID has given all of us the opportunity to raise our hands and to go, okay, what can I do to come out of this stronger, better? Um, because, you know, that's the thing when I talk about intention, it's also about asking yourself, how do I want to emerge? How do I want my family to remember me? How do I want my colleagues, my team, my leaders to remember me? And am I showing up as that person? Thanks, Laurie. Um, Regina's got a question. What is the best way for females to promote or brand themselves in the boardroom, commonly as a gender minority? Thank you for that question. And I think, I think the starting point is before you even walk through that door, you need to ask yourself, what is the self-talk of you going into the boardroom? Um, because you need to walk in there in your own self, you are an equal to anybody sitting around that table. You deserve to be sitting around that table because you're sitting at that table for a reason, because of your skills, because of your accolades, because of what you've done. And I think you need to, number one, walk in there feeling true to that, feeling confident, feeling, knowing that you are there for that reason. And I think the way that you can show up your brand is, is about participating, is about bringing your authentic self, is someone says something, don't not say something because, you know, it may come out or, you know, you're worried about how it will land. But in a very, you know, as long as we're doing it politely in a respectful way and we say, you know what, this is my opinion. And I think this and this would work or this is why I, I disagree with that. These are my views. What do you think? And I think the more we can just get comfortable sharing who we are um, and adding value, where can you contribute? Where can you add value if you, and, and do the prep? So maybe before you walk into that room, what was the preparation that needed to happen? What were the action points from the last thing? What can I do today? Can I be that person that says, right, okay, I'm going to be accountable for sending everyone the action points. How can you own that meeting? How can you add value? And the more that we can keep doing that, 
that's how we start to show our brand and, and gender shouldn't play a role, you know, and, and also don't, I think, and, and, you know, I'm saying gender shouldn't play a role, but what men do better than us is you will share your wins and you'll say, wow, you know, this went really well, got great feedback. So maybe, you know, you got a, an email back from a client complimenting you. You could send it to the whole team and say, wow, guys, this makes it so worthwhile. Thanks, team. So proud of us. Another win for us. You know, and, and so it's, it's also acknowledging the team, but then share your wins. It's okay to tell people when something's gone really well, because if we're not sharing it, it's, it's hard for people to know where we're at. And it's not, there's a difference between obviously boasting and it's not an arrogance, but if you're making also, it's, it's, a, it's a team effort, but be proud that this is what we achieved. This is what I achieved. And again, you're showing your value. Thank you, Laura. Oh, sorry. Um, I see Bulalewa has a question. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, sorry, I accidentally muted you there. So if you can just mute again. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks for question. A quick one. When you're not active on social media, wh what could what impact does that necessarily have on your brand? Supposedly you're not posting, you're really just not active. You may have a presence, but you're just literally not into posting anything. Could that have an impact on your brand? Thank you. Thanks for that question. And it's a really valuable question to ask because I think a lot of people think, well, am I supposed to be on social media? And my answer is if you are not comfortable being on social media then don't be on social media. What I would recommend, though, is that as a bare minimum is you should have a LinkedIn profile. And the reason is that that is, it's a business tool. And it's, it, you know, and often we think about LinkedIn as, oh, well, it means I'm looking for a job. It's not. People expect to find you there. And often before a meeting or before something, people will go into LinkedIn and they want to read about you. And even if you've just got a very simple head and shoulders shot, you know, all of our phones are fantastic. Upload a photo, please. Don't, and, and the reason why I say that is, I always think LinkedIn is the platform where when you look at their profile, I think to myself, do I want to do business with this person? And if there's no picture, I always think, but why are you hiding? So put a picture there, have a, you know, put in the summary, put in what you used to do and, and use it to connect, use it to join groups. Even if you, if you want to go onto it, but you're a spectator and it's just a really interesting way to stay top of mind. What's happening with my industry? What are the latest trends? connect to people in the field. Um, so you don't, you don't have to go on and publish posts and publish articles if that's not what you want to do. So I would say at least at the minimum, just have an updated profile, have an updated presence. Um, but if, you know, Facebook, I mean, I'm not on Twitter. Um, I, I don't enjoy it. I post, for me, social media is purely around inspirational quotes, um, something that I've done, recommendations. So it's comfortable for me from a work point of view, but I don't use it in a personal point of view. I never share anything personal. But if it's not a natural tool for you, then don't do it. Um, I've got a, a client of mine who I'm coaching who is dyslexic. And she says, but I know that I'm supposed to be on Twitter and I'm supposed to be on social media because I've got to, she used to be in operations and now she's moved into head of sales and she's trying to change her reputation and she's trying to change what she's known for. And she says, no, but I'm, I have to be on these things. I have to be on these things. So she says, but I'm dyslexic and it's going to take me forever. And the truth is don't, you know, if it's not a natural platform and it's going to contract you, don't do it. You're not going to not get noticed because you're not there because the trick to social media is consistency. So it's also not going to help for you to, to post once every six weeks and then wonder why it's not making a difference. So if you're going to be in it, be in it. And if you're not going to be in it, it's fine. You know, connections are made and branding is made in conversations, in relationships. Rather put your time and energy to reaching out to your clients, reaching out to, to people that you want to have an impact on. Reach out to sponsors, reach out to mentors, create relationships in the organization. That's time better spent than posting something that doesn't feel authentic to you. So Laurie, on, on that, there's a question on here as well around how do we put the best version of ourselves in terms of virtual presence and profile pictures without really compromising how we look in real life so that we're not compromising too much on our authentic selves. I think that actually- Just be your authentic self. Do you know what I mean? There's no, and I think 
And I think what's been so wonderful about COVID has, has also been, you know, the equalizer that if you think about, I mean, how incredible that everyone around the world, you know, we're all in the same boat now. So no one is expecting, and, and it's forgiving, you know, it's, it's a lot more forgiving. No one is ex expecting these, you know, may fully maked up hair and lighting kind of things, you know, I mean, you see my profile picture on the front, you know, on the front of the slide and yes, because I got it professionally done and, you know, makeup and lighting will do wonders. But this is me. So I make uh, I make an effort. And when I'm doing something like that, I, I, I put in the same effort I would as if I was meeting you in person, because it makes me feel good about myself. And it's who I want to show up to you today. And I think, don't, we, we can't fall into the thing of who do people expect me to be? It's got to be the, the, the only authentic brand is just for you to show up and go, this is me. And you know, and a lot of the time, and if you don't want to put makeup on, and if you just want to have a, this is me in all my glory, then do that, you know, be presentable, but don't feel that there's this expectation to look a certain way, you know, it's, you've, you've just got to be the most authentic person that you are, because again, I came back to the other question, if you're trying to, because then you're going to put that pressure on every single time you have a meeting, well, I can't just show up, I've got no makeup on today, so what, you know, we also, we like, busy and if you've got kids and families and getting things done show up the way you want to show up be presentable you want to inspire trust and that's all you can do so you don't want to rock up in your pajamas and not look like you know and, and kind of visibly show that you know and you should be taking care of yourself so self-care should be a huge aspect um but i think just be your authentic self that's all you can do especially now thanks laurie there's so many good questions here um so i'm gonna try and do fit in three before before our time's up. Um, the, the first one talked about the psycho psychological safety sounds interesting. I think you mentioned that quite earlier in your in your presentation sure. and the related to so how do we get there when the work environment is so judgmental. So instead of being supportive, we seem to focus on how there is non performance. So how do we instill a, a safe environment? I thought that was an interesting one. That's a great question. And for me, I think there's two levels on how we can bring that in. I think starting on it, if, if we start on the micro, if we start on a team level. So if your team leaders, if your managers, if, if I think number one is it can't just be about the work at the moment. And I think if we're having a weekly meeting, there either needs to be a one separate meeting dedicated where we just connect as people. But if you say, well, there's not enough time for that, then great. Then what you need to do is at the beginning of each meeting, first check in, connect. And there's ways we can connect with each other. So it's, how was your weekend? What's going on for you? Everybody go around and let's share what were the highs and the lows of your week last week? Okay. And then say to them as, as leaders, what can I do to support you? Where do you need my support? Um, and when you make it a safe space, if someone says, well, I lost a cousin last week or you know what, it, was, it wasn't my best and I, draw, you know, I lost this deal or whatever it is, that is psychological safety. You are just making it safe as a team to hold each other. It's holding space for each other. So I think the simplest thing you can do is just, what were the highs and lows? Um, you can have everybody coming in with a question of the week. You could have start the, the meeting with a song. So what can you do to bring a bit of humanness, a bring a, a bit of humanity into our meetings. And it's not that anyone has to share anything that they are not comfortable sharing. This isn't about we're going to go around the room and share our deepest, you know, darkest secret. Vulnerability is just about showing this is the human side of me. Geez, guys, I had the most difficult client last week. And I, you know what, I lost my temper with them. But this is what I did to solve it. That's vulnerability. It's about saying, I also make mistakes and making it safe for other people to have that space. Where can I support you? What do you need from the team this week? So they felt like they, there's a connection and belonging. And then it's also from the top down. It's about leadership modeling that and whether you want to create a mental health committee, because just by doing that, you're making that a safe conversation. Um, what else could we do? So, and, and, and again, it's not about, it's, it's making it safe for people to make mistakes. And it's not to say that you as the leader, because there is also um, so being appropriate. So you also, as a leader, you know, you're not going to come out and say, well, I had this drinking problem and sure, you know, it's, there's a space for that. But what a lot of companies have done, and there's one in particular have done it phenomenally well, is they started this mental health committee and someone spoke about 
their addiction. And then someone shared the anxiety they were going through. And someone, and there was a story of the week with someone and, and it was not um, forced. People volunteered for this and it just created this safe space. So, and, and, you know, again, it's just about saying, allowing people to make mistakes, have town hall meetings, um, have, and, and whether it's something that you do with your managers and then each of your managers distill it down because when, and again, that's why we want to put the camera on is because if we're missing what is going on behind the scenes, you don't know if someone's got severe depression, anxiety, mental health is a real challenge and people don't want to speak about it. But, you know, whether you've got facilities like ICAS or, you know, often, you know, they'll go, oh, we've got ICAS, they know that they can use it. A lot of staff still don't want to use it because they're scared of using it. Oh, you're going to see me. So send out an email saying, we've got these facilities, make it safe for them to use the facilities. And if you don't have them, again, just create a safe space that people can share what's really going on, knowing that they're not going to get reprimanded, but rather giving them the support that they need. And also it gives you visibility into what's going on. If they're not sharing where they're at, that's why their work is dropping. That's why they're not motivated. And it's little steps that we can do to create. And you'll see in the slides that I sent as well, I've given some other suggestions. Thank you, Laurie. Um, yeah. A couple of questions, and, and I think I'll do the last one because we're, we're at 10 o'clock now, is what's the difference between we've got brand versus culture, brand versus reputation? So um, that's a really good question. Brand, so, I, so brand is brand can be an individual level so how i want to show up in my capacity then you can have brand on a team level where how do we brand the specific team what is our team values what do we stand for and then you've got brand the parent company now what's interesting is that often what you find in organizations is that there could be a different, there's a difference between a team brand and a and the parent brand. And what you want to do is understand that. So I had an example of a client where we did a team branding workshop. They were more agile. They were more, um, it, it was just a different style, whereas the parent company was a little bit more traditional. And then you've got to figure out, okay, well, how are we going to work together? And when you say, okay, let's brand the team, your brand, brand the way that you bridge brand and reputation is behavior. And culture is not posters on a wall. You can't go, we, you know, we are trustworthy and we are dynamic and we are curious and that lives on a wall. And there's our culture because we put the, you know, we did the thing and there's our culture. Culture is how you live. It's their behaviors every day. Is it a culture? If you trust your people, you've got a culture of trust. Is what is the culture like? That is the way, it's the way we do things. So culture is not something you can force on people. It's the way that we behave and interact. Is it a culture of the performance, you know, even performance management becomes a culture. Do you have one that's output driven, that people can do it in their own times, or is it micromanagement driven? That's a culture. And what you want to do is obviously start to create coherence between a team culture and between company culture. And it's what we do and say every day. That's our culture. That's how people know. So, you know, a, a lot of clients over this time, they have a, they say they've got a family culture. How did they demonstrate that? They didn't do a single salary cut. Exco took salary cuts, but not the staff. That's how they demonstrated, we are a family, we look after you. And so it comes down to deciding what are our values? What are my values? What are my team values? What are the company values? What do we stand for? Now, what does that look like when I deliver it? What are, what is the, and it's the experience. A brand is the experience you have of that person. How am I creating... You know, and, and it's about thinking, am I creating the right experience with the people I'm interacting with on a brand team and company level? And that's why I said everything we do and say that communicates. So that's the Thank short winded, the, the shortest winded answer I can give you on a really, a really big topic. So I hope that clarifies it. Thanks, Laurie. Um, I'm conscious of time and I'm sure a lot yeah. of people are, are leaving as well because they've got some other meetings to go to. There were some great questions here um, and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you who we, who we haven't managed to answer some of your questions. Nikki, if you want, I'm, I'm happy if you want to email them and I can, I can respond in writing and you can send it to, to your members. 
Perfect. Then we'll do that. Um, I think just to end, um, there were a few that asked if you've got any recommended books on professional branding. And I know you've got a program and um, some newsletters to, that you also send out. So maybe just a little bit on, on that because some people are interested in what else there is there on this topic. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Sure. I've got a fortune of podcast books to recommend to you. So I think probably the best thing is I will collate a list and I will send it to the team that they can send out to you. Um, if you, I do training and I do coaching. Uh, I also do a weekly newsletter. So if you logged on to www.beyondthedress.co.za where you'll find my newsletter. It's all this kind of information that comes once a week. And you can email me at Laurie. At, uh, it's there, Laurie at beyondthedress.co.za. Um, let's set up a chat, a conversation, understand what you need. Um, and that's probably the best place to reach me. But I will send the, those recommendations through to the team to pass on. Great. Thank you, Laurie. We'll send, we will send out a thank you email to everyone with the link to the webinar recording and, and anything that Laurie would like to share with you as well. So we'll send that on to you as well. So thank you so much, Laurie, for giving us your time this morning and sharing some really useful and valuable tips with us in the audience. It was fantastic and it was a pleasure to have you. So thank you once again and hopefully I we Thank will you for the opportunity. It's been wonderful. I we'll hope to have you on again sometime in the next year, in the new year. I think Wonderful. We'll Appreciate we'll it. it. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see everyone again, same time, same place next week. Laurie, thank you. Um, Thanks again. We've got the details for Laurie on your screen now um, and we will send that to you as well on the email so you will have her contact details. Perfect. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.